This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster, and this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. Today, we have a very fun episode for you with Garrett Wong from Star Trek Voyager and the Delta Flyers podcast. He took our questionnaire. We talked to him about a whole lot of things. We clear up some rumors. So that's coming. But first, let's cover just a little bit of news, not a lot. Starting with our strike update this time on the Writers Guild strike is that the Directors Guild is not going on strike. They struck a deal before their contract came up. But the actors have voted to authorize the union to strike. They just started negotiating. The producers are still not negotiating with the writers. So they're, you know, it looks like as people predicted, they're going to try to get the directors and and then the actors to agree and then use that as leverage to pressure the writers to come to terms. But, you know, what that means is nothing's going to happen in June. You know, July is the most optimistic end of the strike. So from a very Star Trek point of view, um, nothing's going into production this summer, probably. I don't know if they've set a new date for Strange New Worlds. I, I, I heard some shows are setting production dates in September as a kind of safe, you know, thing to plan around. So maybe they're doing that too. They hope it's a safe thing to plan around. <laughs> I mean, that would be a very long strike if, yeah. if it's still going on in September, but it's possible. Um, so we do have a whole bunch of uh, Strange New World stuff up on the site. A lot of it we talked about last week. There's extra information in those articles and there is more to come. Yeah. Junket interviews, panel recap. Yeah, I mean, we're one, one week away from uh, season two premiere. So our next podcast will be all about that. Yeah. Um, and Tony, you were just telling me there's a new, another new game. Yes, it was just, it was kind of a surprise announcement during Summer Game Fest. And uh, a trailer came out today for a game called Star Trek Infinite. I just got some info from the publisher it's a teaser trailer. They're going to put out more on Picard Day next week, but it's going to be a strategy game tied into the TNG era, and it's coming to PC and Mac this fall. So on June 16th, we'll be learning more on Picard Day, but it's exciting. There's another game coming. Also in the next week, look for my interview with the writers behind Star Trek Resurgence. As you guys know, I'm, I'm a bit of a gamer, and I'm just excited that Star Trek gaming is like a thing again. Yeah, it's awesome. All right. That's that. You know, it's a slow news week, I guess. No, and we covered a lot last week. So part of it is yeah. that we, we encompassed all of the news that we had. All right. So let's get to our interview with Garrett. The one thing I want to warn people about is Garrett has some dogs who decided to get very involved in the podcast. So <laughs> some of it, I think he was finally able to get them quiet and re-recorded some of it. But you might hear a little barking. I'm just warning you. There was nothing we could do about it. Okay, here is the interview. All right, we are here with a great Garrett Wong. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. I think you're our first uh, Voyager person, right? On this podcast. Oh, on this specific podcast? Okay. On this yeah. one, yes. yes. We've done, think we've, yeah, we've talked to Kate and... Most of the other people for the website, but not on this particular podcast. Oh, well, nice. I'm glad to yeah. be the, the first one. And I do uh, talk about the Delta Flares constantly on our podcast. Nice. Constantly. I've, I've been limited to one mention constantly. a month because I constantly talk about it. Because I'm obsessed. <laughs> so does that mean there's a lot of eye rolls from Tony happening when this yeah. is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Where he's well, like, again? Okay. Well, I can see you're wearing the Delta Flyers shirt, which is the shirt I had on earlier today, but I changed. So if I had that on, we we would have been twins. We'd be matching. Yeah. Oh, we'd be matching. Instead, I have my Peace, Love, and Logic shirt right. instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you talk about it, what are you, what are you telling Tony about the- it's it's usually besides just gushing and like, oh, my Monday's so much better. But it's also uh, just specific things that people have said. Like, I learned this fact or I yes. learned this fact yeah. or did you know that? Or yeah. did you know this person? Like, I listened to the the monthly in-depth interviews yes. also. Oh, um, good. And those are fantastic. Yeah. So it's, it's, infor it's informative, you know, which is yeah. great. But my favorite thing about the Delta Flyers is that – we we make you laugh. That's the thing. Like every now and then, you'll we'll say something in a podcast that'll make people laugh a lot. And 
we've gotten in trouble a little bit because I, I remember someone told me they were at the gym and they were on a treadmill and there was somebody who was new to the gym that was with a trainer that didn't work out ever before. And they were working out in front of them. So they were the person on the treadmill is listening to Delta Flyers. Something just made them go, ha! And the, and the person that was being trained turned around and said, how dare you laugh <laughs> at a first time gym person? I am so oh. embarrassed and my confidence, I just, I just, it was very difficult for me even to show up today and you're laughing at me. And the guy goes, oh no, sorry. Podcast, Star Trek, funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As someone who listens on the treadmill and laughs yeah. out loud and yeah. makes noises and yells at you guys and whatever <laughs> sounds I'm making, sometimes I applaud. My family's like, what is going on? Because they can't hear it either. So that's funny. It's, it's a fun it. experience. Well, we are going to talk about the podcast, but sure. first, we really want to start yeah. with this sort of rumor that was yeah. going around based on something you said at a convention. Yeah. Now, like weeks ago. Yeah. So we just we, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we want you to clear the air because so yeah. what, what the story was, was that you'd been invited to do a three episode arc on Picard and that mm -hmm. it was because Harry Kim belongs to Prodigy. Yeah. So, well, can you tell us? No, you know, what I should have just said is there were plans to have Harry, which then got nixed. And I was told by my manager to be in LA around January for a fitting. So it was. You know, this was like pretty solid, right? This was going to happen. And then it didn't happen. But in my conversation, I ended up talking about how you can still see Harry Kim. I'm sure it'll happen either on Lower Decks or on Prodigy because Prodigy seems to have all the Voyager characters, but in animated form, right? So, but when I said that, then people started uh, spreading the rumor that, oh, he's in Prodigy. He's actually going to be on Prodigy as well, right? So that... That's what got muddled and messed up. So, or that there was a rule that you could only be on Prodigy. You no, know, there's no, yeah, there's no such, yeah, there isn't a rule. I just, I just think my words weren't chosen very clearly. I'm going to blame Mercury being in retrograde, which it was for two months <laughs> solid, where all communications and, and, and I, I can feel it. I can definitely feel it. When it's in retrograde, I choose words or vocabulary that I don't normally use and they're not. They're not really the the right words that I should have selected. You know what I'm saying, or or just how I, I how I frame my sentences, or how I how I communicate with people. So I think that really is what the bottom line was. It just got misconstrued, and now there's a lot of people throwing their arms up in the air, going, "What is it? What's happening?" Kind of a <laughs> thing. But the the ultimate goal is to have Harry Kim show up in some way, shape, or form as captain or higher in rank kim <laughs> nice <laughs> in That's live action goal. i think is in your live action saying. exactly because you know i think people would cheer because you we get to see we've already seen tom paris on lower decks so i think people would cheer if there was a captain kim on lower decks that walked onto the cerritos bridge there would be some woohoo but it it's not the same when you see the actual actor live action as promoted, right? I mean, animated, I love animated, but again, I don't know. Do you consider it animated canon? Yes. Yeah. It is. I mean, Lower Decks and Prodigy are considered canon. Canon. Okay. That's fine. But I personally would like to see myself be, you know, Harry be promoted, you know, as a non animated individual. <laughs> How do I say that? I'd like to see Harry promoted as a human. <laughs> I'd like to see, yes. As a human as a, being, as a member of Earth, that's what I would like to un see. Unfortunately, because of where things are with Paramount now, mm -hmm. there's Strange New Worlds, which is 23rd century, and there's going to be this uh, Academy show, which is 32nd century. Yeah. And there's really, there's a straight, this Section 31 movie, who knows, you know, so I'm not, you know, there may not be a, in the short term, a place for that unless they go with this legacy show with Terry wants to do the, the spinoff of Picard, which would be early 25th, you know, yeah. so there, that would be, you know, it'd be easy to throw in captain fleet, captain Commodore. Yeah. You yes. name it. Harry Kim. Admiral. Yeah. <laughs> I, but don't get me wrong. I, I would gladly leave Harry as an ensign forever if I could play an alien on Strange New Worlds with complete prosthetics where you didn't even know it was me, I would take that in a heartbeat. 
over a Harry Kim promotion just because I love that show. So you, <laughs> I love watching, that show. Are you watching all the new shows? Yes. Have you seen- yes. Oh, yes. It's great. Yeah. I can't, I can't not, you know, um, only 10% of all Star Trek actors are actually science fiction fans. That's it. 10% of all the actors that you have grown to love over the years. That's it. Everyone else is just an actor doing a job. And I pride myself in being one of the 10%. I love sci-fi. So yeah, I watch all of it. I mean, I joke around. I say, yeah, Strange New Worlds, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. I'll play a phaser. I'll play an inanimate <laughs> object. I don't even have to be a human for this. <laughs> so yes. Is there a particular alien you'd like to play? It doesn't matter. Just full prosthetics though. Completely full. Um, I'd prefer, I would prefer Klingon if I could, you know. Oh, that's um, fun. But it has to be to the point where you would not re- – like if I was Vulcan, people would be like, hey, that's Garrett Wong as a Vulcan. Like you'd know, right? You'd see my face right. and you'd see the ears and maybe a little eyebrow action here. But come on. No. I'd rather be completely obscured where you had no clue and maybe even ask for end credits. Like so people don't even know from the beginning that I'm in the episode. That's what I would love. And they're really sitting there watching going, gosh – who played that? Was it Jeffrey Combs? No, it's not Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> it's Garrett Wong. Oh, my gosh. So you love Strange New Worlds. I do. What do you, lo- I do. What do you I, love so much about um, it? I love the fact that, okay, what bothered me when Discovery first came out, Discovery is a prequel before Captain Kirk. But yet the very first episode, when you look on their bridge, it's so modern. And it's like, oh, my God. Compare that to TOS 1966. Mm, it's way more advanced looking, right? But Strange New Worlds also predates Kirk. But the set designer, yeah, they've got a modern bridge. They've got a modern interface. But they've also incorporated old school knobs and stuff from like TOS era. If you look carefully, those small details, that won me over. I thought, my goodness, it's shiny. It's a shiny gem. It's a shiny jewel. But you look closely. They've got some analog switches. They've got some, you know, it's 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 not all like moving interfaces with your hand. You know what I'm saying? Just in front of your face. None of that stuff going on there. Uh, I mean, a little bit, but then they still have that connection to the past and that homage to TOS. So that's what I like about Strange New Worlds. I like the casting. I think the casting was really uh, across the board, all those characters. Um, they did a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful job. Um, yeah, so casting, you know, concept of, of of set design, and you name it, I, across the board. I just think that's a really good Trek show. I'm down. I'm down for it. I'm down to do, uh, guest star in that for sure. As a fa- as a phaser, remember, I'll do a phaser. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've always found that Stranger Worlds, even though it's kind of around the original series, it's yeah. actually structured a bit more like the Berman era shows. Interesting. In- in the way it's it's episodic, mm-hmm. um, but the way they, you know, every episode kind of has a focus on a particular character. So yeah. this week it's going to be a chapel show. Next yeah. week it's going to be a, you know, and 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 you guys had that on Voyager. You know, it was going to be a Harry episode and then a Doctor yeah. episode. Yes. And then four, seven episodes. Right. And uh, they're yeah, back there. Four, seven episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and that's an interesting thing. I just going to go down a side alley for a second in our rewatch, because for the Delta flyers, we basically, we, we, we rewatch recap, discuss every single episode chronologically. And both Robbie and I thought that going into this, that season six and seven was literally almost entirely seven of nine. And that's not the case. We're like, wait a minute. We had the wrong perception here. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yes. There's heavy seven when she comes in season four, season five, season six, but as it gets into six and seven, it actually dissipates a little bit. It's really not what we thought. So anyway, that's my side note. Fair fair enough. Fair enough. But on the animated shows, you're you're watching those too, even yeah. even Prodigy. Yes, even Prodigy. Do you like Prodigy? I do, and I I, I messaged uh, I messaged the showrunners of Prodigy, and I said, if John Noble ever has laryngitis, please call me. I will <laughs> I will do that that voice. Um, growing up, my my true love was uh, 
impersonation or, or just doing accents and impersonations. So Rich Little was my idol. I, I oh. loved Rich Little and everything he could do. And that was a man of a thousand voices, literally, maybe even more. Um, so yeah, so, and that's one cool thing about animation is that, you know, it's all voiceover. So I can't, so in reality, if John Noble was to have laryngitis and the <laughs> showrunners were like, you know what, let's give Garrett a shot. I think I could cover for him. And here's the thing. I don't even want to get paid for. I want John Nobles to still get the money. I just want to be able to come in there and do his voice. <laughs> That's how much res- respect I have for John. I, li- I think I think he's a great actor. Um, when he was in uh, in Lord of the Rings, he played Denethor or whatever, and he's the guy that jumps off the Oh, my gosh. He's so good. He's so good in that. Yeah, I loved yeah. him on Fringe. And Fringe, during Fringe. If Kate got laryngitis, you could you step could, in for oh, oh, really? I couldn't. No, because I've heard still, you do it. I've heard yeah, you do it. But it's it's still a man, it's still a man trying to impersonate a woman's vocal cord. I mean, it's just it's not dead on. I if if I if Kate was to get laryngitis, I would say call Nancy Hauer. The woman who played Wildman is has done the best Kate impersonation I've ever heard, Janeway impersonation I've ever heard in my life. And that's because we were friends and we were joking around. And one day she decided to leave a message on my voicemail as Kate. <laughs> and she was like, she's like, Garrett, I'm in <laughs> dire trouble right now. I need you to immediately to call me immediately. I'm, this is a life and death matter. <laughs> and so she's what? And I'm sitting here going, <gasps> and like, I'm hyperventilating. Like, what the, what the, when did she call? I'm thinking like, did I check my voicemail early enough? Like, what's happening? And then at the end of this long, long drawn out diatribe, she, she, all of a sudden you hear, she was like, just kidding, it's Nancy. Bye. Like that. So she she threw her normal voice in at the end. But wow, I've never heard a better Jane Janeway from anyone. So there you go. Excellent. That's who I would go to. Yeah. I did tell George to Kay if he was if he had laryngitis. I would also <laughs> I would also I would also do his voice for free. I'd let I'd let him take all the all the credit and, of course, the the profit from it. I I don't need those those uh, financial things. I just want to do the voice. That's all. So yeah, I mean, if I could do that, oh, that make me so happy. So we need to get the laryngitis virus, and we have a list of people to send it to. <laughs> I, I send. I actually pay somebody to go send the laryngitis virus to, to different individuals. Okay, this month I'll be like I'll be like from uh, who's that, Mister Burns, right there. This month it'll be. George Decay. <laughs> so we send someone to get him out, uh, out of the commission and I do all his voice uh, work. That'd be wonderful. You do a great uh, Robert Picardo too. I, yeah. He always jokes about that. And he says, you know, Garrett, you're, <laughs> he always says that I'm making it, I'm, I'm, I'm ramping it up a little bit. I'm too, I'm putting too much zhuzh into it. Like I, I, <laughs> I need to back off a little bit. Right. So, but uh, yeah, I love doing Bob's voice and really you have to have a very unique you have to have a voice which is it's that's you know that's stylized is the way I can describe it. It has to have a little bit of something to it in order to be impersonated. Roxanne Dawson always says she always prides herself in being the one person I don't impersonate on Voyager. <laughs> and I said, because your voice is so nondescript. That's why. I mean, if it, if it had some weird quirk to it, I could get it. But yours is like a typical new, you know, Midwest newscaster kind of a voice, really. Um, so even Beltran, cause he's kind of got a flat, you know, there's not a lot to work with there. No, but with him, he's like, <clears throat> so every person phrase. has a, yeah, every person has a <laughs> phrase that I get into it. So to do the correct Chicote, it has to be the, the phrase is any luck yet to Vok. Okay. And so <laughs> here's Chicote. <laughs> any luck yet to Vok. Any luck yet to walk? <laughs> I can't, because you guys are laughing, I can't focus. Oh my god! And look yet, and he look yet to walk. But it, but you have to find a jump into phrase, and that's usually it. But tonight it's not dead on; it's close. I did that for Seth MacFarlane, and he was like, "That was a really good Chicote." So I did convince him. Right now, I'm not convincing you or any of your listeners. Well, but, I like when you and Robbie both do it together. Oh, when we do any, and look yet to walk. Yeah. <laughs> look yet in, in what scenario were you? Talking to Seth MacFarlane about Chicote's voice. That oh, seemed, um, <laughs> seemed like an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, when Robbie, Ro- Robert Duncan McNeil, Robbie was directing Orville. I came to to visit. I had a set 
pass to come visit Robbie. And initially, it's funny because initially I asked, hey, can I come down and check it out? Because I've gone to watch Robbie direct Chuck, which is an amazing television show, Chuck, back in the day. And so when he was directing Norville, I was like, yeah, I want to come down. And he was like, oh, man, they're really, you know, they're really tight on on who they allow in as, as guests for this show. Cause they, they're keeping it under the wraps and everything like that. And, and it's got to get authorization from Seth. And I was like, well, can you ask? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I can ask, but I can't guarantee you anything. But then Robbie calls back. He was like, well, yeah, the minute Seth heard it was you. He's like, of course like that. Yes. Harry Kim can co show up on the set of Orville because let's face it. Seth is one of the biggest Trek fans out there to date. And in uh, on our podcast, when we interviewed some of our security guards, we found out that one of our security guards caught a very young Seth McFarland trying to sneak onto the Voyager set. Uh, this is back in the day. He caught him, and he was like, "What are you doing? You don't, you don't, you can't go over here." And Seth basically turned to our our security guy and said, "Listen, this show, this show is my life." like that i just need to go in there just to see the bridge is there any way you can allow this to happen like that and just his passion of how he's how he said this to the security guard made the security guard go okay he took him in and showed him the bridge so there you go seth mcfarland's a huge fan and so that gave me that entree onto the orville set to watch robbie direct that episode and so when seth was there which was every day pretty much um uh, i basically said to him, I love your impersonations. You do some great voices, you know? So I did, I did a couple of voices, you know, uh, from, uh, track. And I think I might, may have even did like a family guy voice or something like that for him. So, um, and then when I did Chakotay, he was like, that's a really good Chakotay. But again, you gotta be in the, you gotta have that little Zen thing going on at the same time. Well, but and, it's also uh, such a deep cut too. Like how many people have a Chicote? you know? Yeah, not a lot. He might. He, I think he does. I want to shift and ask you some Delta Flyer stuff. Yes. If we can. On. Yeah. So um, I do, because you guys are in season seven now. We yeah. are nearing the end. Yeah. So, and you've already talked about some of the, some surprises, like less seven than you thought. What do you guys have planned for the end, for the finale? We have a finale party that we're throwing, um, which is sort of a thanks to our our highest tier of Patreon patronage. So we're doing that. And this is concurrent with the, well, right before the big Star Trek Las Vegas convention this summer. So that's going to be the basically beginning of August will be the time that we review the final episode. So that party is also the final episode of Voyager um, Endgame that we'll, we will be reviewing and recapping and discussing with a live audience this time. So oh, wow. um, at a place we rented out in Vegas. Uh, but in terms of what we're going to do afterwards, we're still kind of working through that right now, just trying to decide what direction we want to go in, how we want to continue. And, and, and definitely that conversation has happened in terms of we do want to keep going and doing something. But at this point, we're still just kind of just talking it out right now because there are certain factors that I'm, I'm not going to reveal, but I was, but if A doesn't happen, then that will lead to B not happening, which will then maybe, maybe we do call it, you know, call it quits at that point, you know? So we'll, mm-hmm. we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I, I'd love to keep it going. Cause I, I do feel, I do feel what, people have gotten very used to in these last three years since we launched May of 2020 all the way till now. Gosh, we're exactly at three years, basically, right? We're actually past it now because we're in June. So we've actually, you know, in all that time, we've become sort of like this Robbie and I become a solo entity (laughs) in a way. Like people are, people are like put us together as like one thing, if that makes any sense at all. And a thing that, that people have looked forward to and have become very comforted by and very used to. So there have been a lot of mail. There's a lot of mail, a lot of communication from fandom and people that are, you know, have been listening to the podcast saying like, please don't end this, (laughs) please. So, and really when you're doing a podcast, you know, you can choose what direction you go in. Right. So right now, um, there's numerous directions we could go in, but again, this is this is discussion that we've been having and we are continuing to have and will continue to have until we make that final decision and that announcement in August of um, this year. So 
That's what I, I mean. Say. I'm one of those people. So my Mondays oh, good. are very special because of you guys. And I wake up on Monday and go, oh, good. It's Monday, which isn't a sentiment. Most you know, people and it's have. true. Mondays is the, <laughs> because the Delta Flyers Mondays is now a day to look forward to, which is usually the worst day of the week. Right. Like, oh, Monday morning. Yeah. So we pride ourselves on that. I, and I think we should have. Mondays are great days shirt or something like that. Right. So great idea. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. You know, you, I mean, you don't limit yourselves to Star Trek. You guys are a great pair. Yeah. Uh, you know, why not? Just because we are Trek actors, that does not mean we should be limited to only Trek projects. Although, you know, that's our niche, right? That's our, that's kind of our yeah. bread and butter. I mean, I, I definitely think that we should continue in a Trek based, um, you know, type of concept, but yeah, why not? Uh, entertain the thought of uh, maybe recapping some other shows. You know, Robbie has so much experience with like with Chuck itself as a producer and a director. I thought, God, that'd be a wonderful show to do a recap with, you know, and maybe God, just to hear all the behind the scenes there. Have both of you seen that show? I'm just curious. Have you I watched? Haven't. I, I know I watched most of it and I've seen the finale, but I don't know if I've seen every episode. Oh, wow. Lori, you need to. Oh, my goodness. Please give it a give it a go. Yeah, I will. I'm telling you I right will. now, it's a it's a wonderful. The concept is awesome. It's a it's a nerdy show, but it's also adventure filled and action filled. It's super fun. It's a really fun and a lot of good comedy. And a lot of that comedy was shaped by Robbie because Robbie always, you know, when he directs, he always says, you know, He'll, he'll try to find the funny in whatever situation that there is. You know, is there any way to bring in the funny? Because let's face it, this is – laughter is is a wonderful thing. <laughs> we need more of that in this world. That is for sure. So I, I'm 100% behind the way he chooses to direct and trying to find the funnier moments in life, which I think we all need more of. So now you've rewatched – Almost all seven seasons of Voyager. Mm. So how do you feel that show stands up for, with the other legacy shows? I mean, the new shows yeah. too, but yeah. wh- where um, do you think it fits in all that? I think it looks pretty good for being as old as it is. When I watch an episode, I don't sit there and go like, wow, that's dated. You know, I, you know, sometimes there might be a visual effect where you're thinking, hmm, yeah, in 2023, that would be way cheaper and a lot more detailed, right? I mean, you'll see that. But other than that, I think it holds up pretty darn well. Um, like when I watch TNG, sometimes I feel like, oh, it's it's an 80s show. You know, I, I sit there and I go, it's it's a little on the slow side at times for me, right? So, um, and I can definitely feel that it is from a certain era uh, compared to, to Voyager, where I think it's it's more even more timely than TNG is in terms of its look, how it looks. Because um, I look at the bridge of of TNG and it's like it's like a log cabin kind of like it's very rustic to me. It's got that light wood paneling, you know. <laughs> and when then Voyager is sort of like okay, we mean business. And that you know when you use those that color palette of of steel and steel gray and whatever that you can you know, that transcends time, basically, you know, you can have that color palette now, 30 years ago, 30 years in the future, and it's still going to look futuristic, it's still going to look modern. So I I think that they made the right choices when it came to set design and just overall look of Voyager. Do do you think the show doesn't get the recognition it deserves? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Because I think each Trek fights the prior Treks legacy or the prior Trek's influence. If you talk about TOS, when TNG came out, the big complaint was, uh, no, I have no interest in watching this bald captain Picard running around. I, where's my Kirk? Where's my Kirk? You know, that was a huge issue with people. Um, and then of course people started loving TNG and then DS9 came out. They said, no, I'm not going to watch some show that's located. It's on a station. It doesn't even move. They don't even go anywhere. What the hell? The only craft they have is a runabout shuttle. Wow. You know I mean? There's just a lot, you know, so there's, again, there's always that prejudice towards the newer show. And then with Voyager, when that came out, you know, oh, am I going to? No, I, I can't. I can't watch this. This is uh this is not uh, this is not up my alley. And the, the initial complaints, there were a lot of complaints about gender. Like, how can you have a female captain? Why is that even possible? I mean, it just of course it's possible, but every show has had to fight against you know fans 
from the prior show. One of my favorite things is meeting a fan who was a TNG diehard, next generation diehard their entire life. Voyager came out and they poo-pooed it. They were like, I'm not going to watch this. Nope, not. You can't even pay me to watch this show. And they resisted and resisted and resisted. And then something called the pandemic happened. And in 2020, when they couldn't go anywhere, they were like, well, fine. If I can't go anywhere, I guess I'll watch Voyager then. And so this is the best of all because they watch it. I've had more and more fans now because of the pandemic come up to me and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, why? I refuse to watch your show. I'm a huge TNG fan. I refused for 20 some odd years, over two decades. But then the pandemic kind of made me watch things I didn't want to watch. And I watched your show. And I wish I would have watched it earlier. <laughs> you know, they're they're almost <laughs> like they almost start crying. And they're like, I apologize for not being converted to a Voyager fan. So they get they get a little passionate about it. And it's and I love that because it's sort of like this delayed reaction fan. <laughs> it took them 20 years to finally come around to it. But yeah, it, I do feel like it doesn't get the respect that it that it deserves. I definitely feel that. But uh, each year that goes by and each each TNG or TOS diehard fan that says, oh, I guess I'll give Voyager a try. Usually we end up getting them on our side too. So it's kind of nice to see that. So in terms of Harry Kim on Voyager, now that yes. you've seen so much of it again, yeah. um, if you could change anything about the show or his arc, what would you change? Um, I think I would be more persistent. You know, I, if I had an idea for Harry... I usually would call up a writer and I would say, "Hey, I, this would I think this would be cool," and they would, you know, it would it would ruminate in their head and they'd think about it, and then usually, you know, nothing would come of it, you know. But I think if I was more persistent in can just keeping at them and saying, "Look, this would be really awesome if we did this for Harry. If we try to make this a B storyline, you know, I think this would help." The character development of Harry Kim. I think if I was more persistent in the, about my suggestion, suggestions and recommendations, or a little bit more forceful, maybe, you know, not to the point of being a jerk, but just like, look, guys, I've been playing this character forever. This would be so cool if we could do this, you know, because I felt like for me, I was kind of looked at as the young and the young and on the show. Like, what's he going to know? He's the young, he's the kid. You know, uh, what are his ideas going to, you think they're worth anything? I don't think so. He's the youngest. He doesn't know anything. You know, I, I felt like I had to work against that that bias, um, unfortunately. And because I knew that I was the youngest, when I did ask or when I did suggest, when I got a no outright, I was like, okay, that's fine. I won't even ask that ever again, you know? Whereas I think with some other some of the other characters, or some of the other actors, persistence sort of paid off. Like they kept bringing it up. Like I really like my character to do this. And when that happened, you know, Good things happen. But I, I, if I had to change it all, I'd be a little bit more persistent. Um, like I really would have liked to see a shipwide talent show as a B storyline. And Harry Kim gets up and does his impersonation of all the crew members. <laughs> and I think that would be my stand up. That would be my, you know, talent show participation. And, and it would be funny. I'd, I really would have enjoyed that. But instead, if you look at the run of the show, there are people impersonating people, but it's never Harry. It's yeah. always it's it's seven of nine impersonating the doctor because the doctor is in her cortical node, you know. And then oh, it's it's uh, Barkley Barkley from TNG days joining us, and he's doing his Tuvok impersonation, his Janeway impersonation, his, and it's just like oh, uh, and all of those scenes where all those characters that weren't Harry doing impersonations. They wrote Harry into that scene. So I had to stand or sit and watch other people do impersonations, which was a slow death to me. It really was because I love it so much and I wasn't allowed to do that. So, yeah. So if I had to do it again, I would say let's have this be storyline. Let's move into our Star Trek questionnaire. If you're sure. Ready for that. Let's start with, can you give us an underrated either episode, movie or character? Um... I'm going to say Neelix. I think there's a lot of, especially it, even, you know, when we were filming it, even now that the show's been done for over two decades, sometimes I hear some crap about people like kind of giving some shade towards Neelix. And I'm not, I'm not down with that. <laughs> it kind of makes me a little bit pissed off to be perfectly honest. So 
Um, I do think that was a complex character. I do think that was a character that, you know, was important to Voyager. And I find that, that, that more than any other character is a bit underrated. I'm going to go with Neelix. I always felt like they moved away too quickly from his alienness. Like he was so funny at the beginning mm. and his, the, the way, like he would sniff thing, like he was very physical. Yes. And then as to, I think they, they humanized him too much too soon. Interesting. I like that take though. Cause that he was sense. phenomenal when he, he was, he was just being yeah. a weirdo. He was great. Well, you know, and it's interesting cause Robbie talks about how he was weird and he also had some edge to him. Like if you look at his yeah. wardrobe, he had that, that funky black overcoat thing and then they took that away and all of a sudden it was oh let's put grandma's um you know curtains and uh table you know <laughs> cloth on neelix as his wardrobe and it's like what is going on yeah. and he was kind of i mean not a criminal but he, he had an edge certainly an yeah, edge to him in yeah. the beginning you know Most definitely it, which disappeared all of a sudden it was like wait a minute where'd yeah, that go he, right he yeah. got very squishy by the end he did he did get yeah. squishy he was adorable yeah do you have a contrarian opinion star trek opinion besides neelix yeah um something that just doesn't make sense is what you're saying is that what well, you're, something you're going that, like people you know that that average fans you know may not agree with i guess is like my well, example i always give is that i'm the only person who thinks seven and chakotay were a good couple oh okay so it doesn't have to be something like it's just something that everybody agrees with that you think differently like spock's about. brain is the best episode right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, i'm a fan of uh threshold robbie mcneil's lizard episode i'm actually a fan of that episode i i think it's a good episode for robbie and it gets a lot of flack from a lot of people, mainly because of the salamander baby scene at the end. I think I think people just flip at that and they're like, I can't believe I watched this. They get really angry about that. Right. So. So what's the nerdiest Star Trek thing you've ever done or perhaps the nerdiest thing you own? Hmm. And it could be something you kept from Voyager or it could be something you've picked up since. Um, I, I kept, okay. If you, when you see Harry at his station on the bridge, he's at the operations slash communication station. And so I, when you see him standing at the console, there is a huge panel behind Harry. I, I have that entire panel. So I took that. Oh my God. Me. So, yeah. So the hope is to actually put that into some type of you know, I, I've got to get someone to make this like some type of light box, you know, that can actually light up and maybe even because there is a center part for where the screen where an actual screen was. Right. So it's just clear at that point. So that then I can actually put a flat screen right inside there, too, so that it can really <laughs> I can really do this thing up to make it look like it was. If you stuff. tweeted out that you wanted to do this there, you know. Ten there are, people would have me. There are there's so there many are, Trek yeah. fans who are yes, are craftsmen and trades people that could help me yeah. out and form yeah. and yeah. make thing or maybe three D print something for me. Yes, I, I you're right. So maybe uh maybe or, they'll or hear maybe this. Doug, maybe Doug Drexler or Dave Blast will just you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought about that. I was like, why don't I just go back and talk to some of these set designers and these props builders and say like, hey, it's me. You know, help me out. They'd love so, to do it. I yeah, bet. Like, I think they, they would. Took such joy in doing Picard season three. Those guys had, yes. such, you know, oh it was goodness. a labor of such love. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. Did they know you were taking it? Is the big question. Yeah, because they were just saying that you know we're not going to really store any of this stuff. And to be perfectly honest, I wanted to take stuff from engineering. But because the last scene shot was on the bridge, it was all the bridge crew. While we were working, Bob Picardo, who was not working, was unscrewing everything that wasn't nailed down <laughs> on. And like, he took everything. Like he took. He yeah. when I walked into engineering, it was picked clean. It was like, oh my god! I go, where is everything? I I talked to some crew person. They go, Bob Picardo. I go, oh my goodness. There's nothing left. And it's what's so funny is that for, I'm going to say, 17 years after Voyager's end, every convention I was at with Bob Picardo, he would auction something off for charity from the engineering, whatever. Like he had so many things. It was almost like an embarrassment of riches. Um, but 
that's one reason why I took my panel because I knew he couldn't get, he couldn't get onto the bridge while we were filming. Right. So that's the only, only untouched area of, the, of all the sets. Everything else was picked clean by the non bridge work uh, crew, basically the non bridge actors. So, so that's why I took that, that panel. That's all that was left. Didn't they use some of your set? I mean, they were redressing them, but they were using the bones of some of those sets for Nemesis. I thought. Did they? Didn't they? Oh, I they don't might have. I know for hmm. some of the movies. I know for some of the movies. I think they did. Well, some of the other movies. I mean, I, all I know is that our transporter, our transporter pad ceiling was the floor on uh, Star Trek: The Movie, the first movie. So. Does that make sense? So they flip that, you know, what they use as yeah. the ground as as our ceiling uh, of our transporter pad. Yeah. So there's a lot of that in, you know, through the movies and yeah. the TV yeah. shows. I mean, it would, it, yeah, it would make sense though, right? For budgetary concerns, if you can sure. repurpose it, repurpose the dang thing. Yeah. I mean, there was a time, and you were there during this time in the '90s. There would be moments where they were shooting two shows and a movie on the set. Yeah. They they, they were running what like 10, 12 stages at once. Which is roughly half the lot. Yeah. Was a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was that like to be like? It must have, you know, Star Trek was ruling, you know, the Melrose. It really was. You're right. Yeah. Um, I, we didn't think of anything out of the ordinary. You know, it was just it. It was what it was. You know, <laughs> or it is what it is. However, you want to say it. I I just remember when we walked off us when we walked out of the bridge set, which is on stage eight, and we walked out to go back to our trailers in between setups. Uh, we could see directly across, we could see DS9 actors popping onto set right across from us. Like you could, you know, you could hit them with a, with a brick or a stone if you threw it. And that's how close they were. <laughs> Not that I would throw stones or bricks at DS9 actors, but I, <laughs> I really thought that was interesting that we could just see them. They were there. Those are our cousins, our Star Trek cousins. They're right there. Um, when we had, uh, there was a huge earthquake in LA that shut down production everything and there's no power all this crazy stuff and i remember i actually helped tracy scoggins who was actually in full cardassian makeup i think she i mean just full on and she was freaking out because she was like oh my god oh my god and i was in the in that area that space between stage eight and then stage four or whatever it was wherever ds9 was across the way and like everyone was outside you know everyone like we didn't know what to do and and I just walked over to her and I remember she was just almost hyperventilating and I calmed her down. And to this day, any convention that I'm at where she sees me, she's like, my savior, you know, like I'm the person that, yeah, that calmed her down and was able to keep her from like flipping out that we were, just went through an earthquake and she was in full Cardassian makeup. So, you know, it was not out of the ordinary or not. And I guess now that I think of it, that's pretty amazing that we did have Voyager had three sound stages. DS9 had three. If they're shooting a movie there, they'd have three or four. So yes, a lot of that lot of Paramount lot was Trek for sure. Let's jump to the next question, which is, I mean, I know you guys talk a lot about um, shipping that all the people who ship Janeway and Chakotay, but what two characters would you ship anywhere in the Star Trek franchise? Um, Tuvok and Seven. <laughs> Cause Ooh. they're so similar. <laughs> I mean, they, they're they both just into their own world. They don't like to socialize. They like, you know, they're very precise about their, <laughs> whatever they're saying. And it's just, you know, it's just the perfect relationship. Like, granted, you know, Tuvok is in a, he's married. I get that. Married. But I'm just saying, yeah. like in, in a fantasy world, I'd, I'd say those two. Yeah. <laughs> of, of, of anybody. Do you think Janeway and Chakotay should have gotten together? Or would that have been weird? Oh my gosh! If I was to, if someone was to hand me the the reins to film a Voyager movie, my first shot would be of Janeway in bed, like she's waking up, and you just see a close up on Janeway, and all of a sudden, in pops a head to kiss her on the cheek. It's Chakotay like that. So that's, <laughs> you just you just see the tattoo, you like see it's the, the whole. You see the tattoo, yeah, and that's it, like that, right? That's it. <laughs> you see the tattoo, and you hear the the little kiss sound, and that's it. That's all you get. <laughs> and that's how I begin and then my. No book. other mention for the rest <laughs> yeah, of the, the movie. Rest of the movie, <laughs> I never bring that up. Right, it's just done. <laughs> it's so funny. I love it. Yeah. Are there are there any fan theories? You hear fan theories. Are there any Voyager fan theories that you've heard? Maybe a Kim theory. Yeah. That you like crazy. Well, the um, not that I like, but the craziest one of why Harry was never promoted. 
was that Janeway was secretly having a relationship with Harry and that she did not want to let out there that she was playing favorite to him. <laughs> so Harry is basically Janeway's boy toy and she does she's she doesn't want, you know, she feels like it would be it would be playing favorites to promote Harry. Um yeah, so that's one theory that I laugh at. It's the only um, reasonable explanation. Well, then the other one I hear, <laughs> which is kind of silly, is that she didn't promote him because the Harry Kim that's alive now is really a duplicate. It's not the original Kim. The original right. Kim was sucked into space uh, during the episode um, uh, Deadlock. So that is kind of where people are going. Yeah. Isn't uh, that actually true, though, uh, to an extent? Yeah. What do you mean? That, that he's the I mean, duplicate? Yeah. 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 But it's, if he so, it's, but if he's a duplicate, he is a duplicate. That's my point. Like he's still <laughs> everything that that Harry Harry Kim sucked to space thought about. Harry Kim duplicate thinks about the same thing. Like they're exactly the same. Thought processes, physicality and everything. So I find that, you know, it's a little it's a little bit silly. It, it should have it should have happened. There should have been a promotion. Season yeah, four. Naomi Wildman was also the duplicate, right? The two of you. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Because I saved her, right? You did. Yeah, I did save her, Thanks. and then I did get to shoot those Vidians, <laughs> and I did. And I, the, my forward role. I talk about that in the Delta Flyers. The forward role was my decision. I was like, I said, guys, I want to Jackie Chan this thing. I said, I want to come in here, and I want to do a forward role flip thing when I shoot one Vidian because initially the director was like, you're going to come in, shoot, duck, and shoot. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to shoot forward roll a la Jackie Chan and then shoot again. So I got to squeeze that in. That was my my one contribution to Harry that didn't get vetoed. So that's a good thing. What part of Star Trek canon do you find hardest to swallow? Like, like that nobody uses money, for example, is a good... I don't know. I, I guess... The hardest thing for me to swallow from Star Trek canon would be how useless the prime directive is at times <laughs> to, to different captains throughout the history of Star Trek. It's sort of like, why do you even have a prime directive? You're always breaking it, everyone. It just, I don't know. That's just a side thought. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll answer with Any that. Any thoughts on who broke it the most? Janeway. Is that right? Is Janeway, Janeway the biggest breaker? Or, or Kirk? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who, but... Janeway has special circumstances. I mean, Kirk only had three seasons and a couple movies. So, uh, um, <laughs> so if you extrapolate it out there, then maybe it's Kirk. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, right. it I would probably be Kirk. Kirk in the end. Yeah, okay, um, yeah, too. that makes sense. <laughs> so, which character or characters from a different show other than Voyager would be pals with Harry Kim? Huh? Any show or movie, even animated, <laughs> even animated. Um. Would be pals with Harry, or would you friends yeah, like with Harry? Yeah, like hang around with, like you, you know, they'd have an adventure together. Well, from TOS, I'm gonna say Scotty for some reason. I don't know why, but Scotty. That could be just my love of all things Scottish, though. So, um, <laughs> when I was in college, I actually I designed my own tartan and my own um, coat of arms <laughs> because I. I felt bad. I felt like, you know what, <clears throat> being Chinese American, I don't have a coat of arms. And so I went and looked at like Scottish tartans and Scottish coat of arms and designed my own. And I painted it over my apartment door and the, on the wall. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> From TNG, I think Harry would be friends with Jordy. I think he would be. I think that's pretty logical. Although he would be intrigued with data, but I think Jordy and Harry would be easy friends uh ds9 i'm gonna say bashir but that's maybe because i just love alexander sadig <laughs> as a human being so maybe that's biased um and then uh from enterprise i would say that uh i think harry would get along with trip pretty well so yeah so those are my choices of that era of trek that's a good selection yeah yeah i like it Mm -hmm. It's a a good selection to go out for, you know, boys night. Yeah. You know, nice yeah. crowd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if it's Discovery, yeah. Oh, my God. Harry would love Tilly. Harry would love Tilly. Harry would just, Harry would, Harry would fall in love with Tilly probably. So there you go. Oh, yeah. I there's agree. Some, there's, there's a ship out there. Yeah. The I just, oh, yeah. my gosh. I just shipped it right there. The KT ship, Kim Tilly ship. 
<laughs> or TK, Tilly Kimchip. Well, you finally have Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, next question. What's an unintentionally funny thing in Star Trek that you love? Like a crazy outfit or a weird situation or a weird alien behavior, just something that is always fun. Just just the TOS fight song. That to me is hilarious. <laughs> I mean, that that is the best. I, I laugh at that. Probably because what's his face uh, was doing that in uh cable guy. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. You're on my wavelength. Yep. So yeah, in Cable Guy, that that scene was just hilarious. Um, but he's a big Trek fan too, though, right? From what Jim I heard. Curry. Oh yeah, yeah, Jim Carrey. He, he has a great Kirk. He does a he did, w- fact, awesome Kirk. Yeah. He did Kirk in um, God. See, now I'm dating myself, but he did Kirk in Ace Ventura. Yes, he did that whole That's scene right. as Kirk. So I, I'm really curious to know what other Trek impersonations does Jim Carrey have in his bag of impersonations. I'm sure he has I, them all. I, I would love to hear them all. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just to be, yeah. If I ever come across Jim Carrey, I'm just going to say, look, I need you on a podcast not to talk about your life, just to do every impersonation of every Trek character known to man. How's that? And he might agree to something like that. He might be like, oh, well, okay. Yeah. Well, we're cooking. I mean, why not? Boy, that'd be fun. Do you have a burning Star Trek question? Something that you like? Like I've, you wonder whatever happened to these guys, or maybe, and maybe a Voyager thing of like, why not? Why didn't we ever follow up on this thing? Hmm. That kind of thing. Yeah. What's up with the salamander babies? That's the question <laughs> of the hour, right there. <laughs> Come on, you just leave three, three infants, basically. You know what I'm saying? If you have the technology to reverse Paris and Janeway back to human, you have the technology to reverse those babies too, okay? So that's my burning question. Where are they? What are they doing? Are the abandonment issues really just, you know, sort of messing with their head right now? Which I would think it is, for sure. Your mom and dad would just leave you in the swamp and take off. That's horrible. And didn't the doctor had a kid on a planet too? He's like my son. Remember in a uh, blink, blink of, blink an, of eye, an eye, he says my son, and they're all like, "What?" I love it. Now, like, now oh, a fifth member. It's, so yes. now we have a yeah. whole family. Yeah, here. we have a whole army of people who are mad at Janeway and company. Everyone left left behind in the yeah. Delta Quadrant. There you go. I always mm-hmm. thought the salamander babies could grow up and be on lower decks. <laughs> It's still a salamanders, right? They're they're still yeah, looking like they sa- can yeah. still be salamanders. Yeah. yeah, that's the way to do it. I, I'm shocked that you know because they have dolphins right on lower yep. decks. So they those two dolphins could have been the salamander babies if my, <laughs> if Mike McMahon sort of you know d- did that acid trip and then he'd be like, wait a minute, the salamander babies. So yeah, that would have been wonderful. It's not mutually exclusive. Let's just say I'd love to see a salamander in a Starfleet uniform. Yeah. And then, then in that episode, we'll always have Tom Paris. The, they come and confront their yeah. dad. They're like, you left us. You're the worst dad ever. They're like screaming at him and everything and throwing stuff at him. That would have been interesting. Just breaking his plate over his <laughs> yeah, head. Yeah. You see this plate? You see this commemorative plate? <laughs> Crash. Just thrown down on the ground. Yeah. God, you know, we could talk to you forever, but, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Are we done with the questions? Are we done with the questions? Yeah, we're, we're definitely done, done, done with the questions. questions. Good. I just want to make so, sure we finish those. So We did. Those okay. were fun. Thank okay. you. Well, Garrett, thank you so much for spending so much time with us and answering all of our insane questions. You're welcome. I had a blast. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. And see you on Delta Flyers. And in the words of Vincent Harry Kim, always remember, to the journey. <laughs> <laughs> wow that was quite the interview he had so much to say about everything i was kind of glad that he was willing to keep on going including taking the you know our second star trek questionnaire which ended up to be mostly a voyager questionnaire in the end i think but that was fitting right yeah well i think it makes sense that that's where his strongest opinions are because that's you know where he had skin in the game as they say but he's clearly watching the other shows. He's aware of the other shows. Um, I think he's watched everything, it, it feels like. You know, we started with the clearing up the stuff from the convention, something we never reported on the site because we immediately heard it was unclear, you know, when this came out that what he said at this convention about 
prodigy, but I feel like he's cleared that up now. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, when it came out, you very rightly said, I need to hear the recording before we report on that story, which we all agreed with. Like, if we can't hear him say it, and then he himself admitted that he kind of messed up what he was saying. But we, I think I think it makes sense now. Yeah. I mean, Terry may have said that, you know, he, you know, he considered lots of people, you know, he considered Naomi Wildman. And, you know, so I, I think uh, there was a, a Garrett Wong, you know, uh, Kim consideration. For well, Picard. beyond that, because he was told he, they had fitting scheduled. Yeah. You know, they also considered, uh, you know, Janeway. They probably considered everyone you know, at some point. I don't know if they booked everyone for a costume fitting, but they no, definitely yeah. considered there were a lot of people that were that were on that potential list. And it would have been great to see him. But I'm hoping that I love his idea of being on Strange New Worlds as an alien nobody recognizes. <laughs> I hope he gets to do that. But I also really want to see him on Lower Decks. Yeah, that would be kind of fun. But, you know, the fans want to see whatever happened to Harry Kibb. Did he ever get promoted, et cetera? And I don't see how that's going to happen except on the uh, animated shows, you know? So I think Prodigy is probably going to pick up that ball sometime, maybe not season two, but hopefully there's a season three. Yep. All right. Well, why don't we wrap up the week with our bits? What have you got to talk about, Tony? Mine is a podcast. It's called The Novelizers with Andy Richter. It's a celebrity comedy podcast retelling star trek to the wrath of khan it's kind of weird um <laughs> but it's a bunch of different comedy writers they split up the thing each one writes a chapter essentially a scene you know the well-known writers are david a goodman is one of the writers you know he's you know futurama and star trek lots of different celebrities then uh narrate these sections including christina chong narrates part one it's hosted by Andy Richter. It kind of, you know, what it, it doesn't make sense when you hear about it, but it does when you kind of listen to it, I think. Yeah, H. John Benjamin is involved as well. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Pat Oswalt, you know, so it's uh, <laughs> Felicia Day. It's funny. Um, the, I, yeah, the first episode wasn't as funny as the second one, and it was better, and the third one was even better. So it's it's just kind of a funny that's so fun. I'd love to find out why they chose that to start with. And Andy Richter, someone I've been a fan of for a long time, but I didn't know that he was a Star Trek fan. Is he a Star Trek fan? How did that happen? I mean, he must. I don't know, but it's an intriguing idea. Do you want to interview him? I bet we could make that happen. I love him. I I worked with him before he was famous. So we, we Andy and I go way back, man. You and your buddy, Andy. Well, yeah, why don't we, you text him? <laughs> exactly we did i just need to so we did a pilot for mt we did he and a group of people who later became even more famous did a show called head cheese it was a pilot for mtv very random <laughs> that was not picked up i assume it was not picked up but i was a pa on it oh. yeah it's fun he, he was super nice Another insight into the past of Laurie Ulster. <laughs> yes, I have lots of little weird <laughs> secrets like that. So mine this week is also a podcast. It's the greatest interview with William Shatner I've ever heard. So it's Mark Maron's podcast, WTF with Mark Maron. And Shatner could not do his laundry list. He could not steer things back to what he wanted because he's with Mark Maron who wants to have a real conversation. And it's two old Jews, which I loved <laughs> as a fellow <laughs> Jew. It was delightful to listen to. I, his take on anti-Semitism made me laugh, William Shatner's, because it was, what are they even talking about? Which is exactly how I feel about it. So I won't ruin it for you. I will only say it's my favorite William Shatner interview I've ever listened to. He does so many, so it's hard for someone to crack the code. And get, you know, and get him to talk like a real person. Yeah, well, if anyone can do it, it's Mark Maron. So that's it for a, a extended interview episode. Um, thank you for sticking with us during the hiatus. We'll be back to reviewing brand new episodes of Star Trek next week. See you then. <laughs>